Welcome to the show. Rob Brown here with the Accounting Influencers Podcast, another episode where we interview influencers all over the world with something to say to an audience of accountants. We have 35,000 listeners in 150 countries and a really appropriate guest today, given that we've just come out of Mental Health Week throughout the world. It's Justin Grant. Good day to you, Justin. Nice to be here, Rob. Thanks for having me. Well, Justin, for people that haven't come across you, yes, we're going to dip into mental health. You've got some amazing insights to share, but tell people what you do in your day to day. Well, my day-to-day uh, is podcast production, as a matter of fact, and um, I have a particular focus on accounting podcasts. Give us a little uh, insight into the two shows that you do run, Justin, because they'll be familiar to our audience and uh, the friends of the show here, and we'd like to give them a shout out too. Absolutely. So I've been with the Unique CPA uh, with host Randy Crabtree for about three years. And uh, he actually just recently had his 100th episode, uh, which was a really great milestone. And I had the pleasure of hosting that and interviewing him, turning the tables on him. So that was a lot of fun. That's so cool. And given Podfade and how so many podcasts don't make it past 10, 12 episodes, he he stayed in the game, hasn't he? He really has. And and he will be the first person to say that it's just been one of the best things he's ever done. Uh, It's opened up so many avenues for him um, and his network and just the people he knows and has gotten the opportunity to meet. He's just thrilled with that aspect of it. Sure. Well, we did an interview with Randy and on this show and I appeared on his show as well to talk about right. our strokes. We both had a stroke. So yes. I'll put the link to Randy's show into the show notes here. And your other show is CPA Live. Tell us about that one, Justin. That's right. That's John Randolph's show. He's with Benaya Consulting Group and they're a, a CPA staffing agency. And CPA life is really focused on shaking up accounting, taking the old ways that we've always done it that way and just turning it on its head. So he has had a number of great guests already that talk about ways in which either they personally or firms they've worked for or what have you approach accounting in a new direction. Well, it perhaps needs a new direction, Justin, given all the things going on. Uh, And generally, what kind of shape do you feel the accounting profession is in right now from what you're hearing from all of these interviews? I would say the biggest uh, of many things seems to be finally maybe a little bit getting away from the billable hours uh, paradigm and moving over to a more just accurate way of measuring uh, productivity and also a, a way that's fairer to the clients ultimately in billing them for what you do for them. Yeah. Well, John Randolph's show on staffing, we know that talent is such a big issue at the moment. Yes. The great resignation, the great recalibration, which speaks a little bit to mental health. People have come to that line in the sand where they're drawn and said, I don't want to go on like this anymore. I don't like the old ways of having to work many, many long years chained to a desk in the hope of making partner. There is a different way. And We know they're coming out of accounting. They're not taking accounting degrees. They're going into fintech and industry and everything else. So to that degree, do you feel the profession has something of an image problem, Justin? I'm leading you a little bit there, but (laughs) does it have an answer to make that? I do believe there's an image problem. You see, uh, for example, um, it's not just in, in the UK. Certainly it's in the US too, that there are far, far fewer people going into accounting as as a degree course, for example. Um, U.S. university graduates on on aggregate have dropped in about 30 years from 2% of the total to only 1% today. Um, In the UK and Ireland, there's been a drop in the past few years around 25 to 3% of how how many students are enrolling in in accounting degrees and there's a similar staff shortage uh, across the pond either direction. Um, The ACCA says 90% of employers are experiencing skill shortages. It's crazy. If I were to make you the czar, the global czar of accounting, what would you do to change it, Justin? Is it a quick fix or is it a long plan? Well, I think that probably it's a long plan. And one of the reasons is certainly for the people at the top pulling the strings um, from the big four down for a while, it works for them because they're quite well off. They're maybe not having to do what new hires and even 
you know, partners that are just made partner and things like that are having to do in terms of hours of work weeks. And they may be experiencing skill shortages, but it hasn't been enough to really cut much into their compensation. So they're okay with it. So if I were the czar, I'm not sure I would have the power to say, well, sorry, you're going to have to take a pay cut or something like that. However, it would be nice to see a little bit more uh, desire from them to, to make things a bit livable uh, for those that they work uh, with well, and who work for them. Good luck changing partner comp models in accounting firms. Exactly. <laughs> the hierarchical <laughs> structures. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about your story, Justin, but let's just tap into your expertise in producing, listening to podcasts. You've got a very attuned ear to what makes a good podcast. And we know that many people out there, particularly during pandemic times, have done an uptick on their utilization of podcasts. They're becoming yes. popular. Surely there's millions of them. We know that. But what, in your view, makes a good podcast? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, one thing that I think is underrated, but that is also hard to get people to exactly put their finger on because most people aren't audio experts. Mm. But if they hear something and they may not even realize it all that consciously that makes the podcast not quite look or sound professional, they're more than likely to be turned off by it. And it can be something as simple just as you know, not quite great audio quality. Mm -hmm. Or I'll guess with a lot of ums and ahs and pauses and that sort of thing, or hosts for that matter, uh, that those are the sorts of things that people will, to a point, tolerate. But if you can't get a good sound, especially, and certainly in the case of a show like yours, a nice visual presentation too, people will maybe just kind of fade away and not not be interested in continuing to follow the show even if they found it in the first place sure you, you can get anyone to hear your show once but getting them to come back that's a big deal exactly. i'm glad you picked up on the quality because there's been a glut of podcasts people coming into yes. the market low barrier to entry just click a microphone and go and the tech's not bad these days it's probably better no. than it was and this it certainly doesn't need to be a Hollywood production, but you're absolutely right. right. There needs to be some element of quality in there so that people will, will appreciate that there's a bit of care and attention gone into it. That's it. And obviously having someone who knows kind of the technical side and can listen to some audio and say, okay, I've got ways to clean this up, even if mm. it's not perfect from the get-go. But then on the other hand, having someone you can talk to about what kind of equipment do I need? How should I set up my room? Are there things I can do th that maybe I don't even realize I'm doing uh, to change that would improve things? Uh, those yeah. are all very important factors. You also brought up uh, one of my pain points is people wasting words. There's so many ums yes. and errs and kind ofs and sort ofs and you know what I mean? And they say a hundred words and only five of them are valuable. Right. <laughs> and you, you get it a lot from the celebrities and the people on the television doing the interviews, even the newscasters. It's a, it's a lot of waffle in there. And I, I don't coach people on it specifically, but I'm very mindful of making every word count. And that mm. must be tough for you as a producer and editor of podcasts to get rid of all of that if there's plenty in there. It, it is. It's probably the most time consuming aspect of it. and But it is something that I find very important. And it's it's always a struggle because you want to keep the conversation sounding natural, but it can be very easy if you're not experienced with dealing with the audio to make it sound choppy and pasted together. So it's a challenge to both remove all those things and keep it flowing the way it should. Yeah. And from an accounting perspective, we've got a database of the main accounting and fintech shows in the world. Have a guess how many there are, Justin. Oh, gosh, that. I don't know, but I would guess on the order of a couple, maybe 3,000. Wow, not that many that okay. we've come across. <laughs> maybe there's a lot more out there that we have <laughs> researched, but we've got a database of 500 now. 500, okay. And so KPMG and Deloitte and mm -hmm. Ernst, they'll all have their own podcasts. Some of the networks have their own podcasts. He seems all the world in his wife and the vendors often now in the software right. and fintech world, they have their podcasts. 
there's a lot of accountants doing podcasts for entrepreneurs and businesses. Mm -hmm. There's a few businesses and entrepreneurs doing podcasts for accountants to be their coaches, mentors, gurus, consultants, trainers, those kind of things. So there's plenty out there and there's certainly a lot for an accountant to listen to. So if an accountant came to you and said, John, give me a, sorry, Justin, give me a steer on what I should be looking for in an accounting podcast. How would you guide them? Well, I would say that if you're going to be listening to an accounting podcast, even though this is obviously something you're doing for the sake of your career, probably not for your leisure time. Yeah, sure. It still probably ought to be something you find enjoyable. And so if you get a host who is dynamic, who has knowledgeable guests on that are entertaining to listen to, you're more than likely going to retain a lot of what you're hearing. Whereas if you're listening to maybe what is the objectively best from an informational standpoint, but perhaps not presented quite as well or interestingly, you may not get as much out of that. Mm. Well, let's talk about your life a little bit, Justin. You're a law graduate. Talk to us about the early days of you choosing the lane that you would go down with your career. Sure. So I graduated with my law degree in 2012, actually in December, and took the bar exam that early spring in 2013 and passed. That was in the state of Arizona. And I entered into an Arizona legal market that was at basically its lowest point ever. Okay. And so I was forced to start practicing, just open my own practice and do it myself. And wow. in the course of doing that, discovered, yeah, I, I'm having to talk to lawyers every day. This maybe isn't everything I dreamt about. <laughs> of course, there's plenty of nice lawyers too, but uh, a few of them, it wasn't the best experience. And I just also found from a personal standpoint that I was having a great deal of difficulty separating my work life from my personal life. I would find myself laying awake thinking about my clients' issues. Mm -hmm. And so for me personally, I realized it was going to be very difficult for me to separate those things. And so ultimately, I started looking in a different direction. It wasn't, however, until COVID hit that I kind of revisited a hobby I had, uh, which was narrating audiobooks of all mm -hmm. things. And I started to do a lot more of that. And that audio link kind of then brought me into the podcasting world. Well, you say you lay awake, awake thinking about your clients' problems. Also, if you hang up your own shingle and you're doing your own business, you've got to think about where your next client's coming from or what That's are you true. doing to grow the business and your chief cook and bottle washer, as we say. You're doing everything in that business. Even if you're working for somebody in a professional firm, you're employed. Yes. You've got quotas to hit, billable hours to hit, clients to answer to, bosses and managers and leaders to answer to. There's a lot going on in the mind of a professional, isn't there? There certainly is. And so my experience with that, and especially, as you said, uh, doing everything, including washing the bottles. <laughs> um, Making the tea. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it definitely informs kind of my approach to now working with professionals and, and helping them with the podcast, because I know that really at the core, they're experts at what they do. Mm. And there's a lot of lost opportunity cost if they're also taking the time to record, produce, market, everything else, their podcast. So it, it's, it's a good nexus, I feel like, that I'm able to kind of bring those two worlds of experience together. Well, there's an expectation in professional life that you study for the bar or whatever it is, your CPA qualification in England, you know, it's the Chartered Associations qualification. That's hard. They don't give those qualifications away. So it's blood, sweat and tears. It's many hours. They're difficult, but you pass. And there's an expectation then that you can deal with a high level of stress and overload and workload and, and you can churn through it and you can assimilate a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the jump from qualifying and going through your exams to coming into a professional environment, Justin, where you've got to bring all of that to bear and hold down a job and answer to so much more. Yeah, it's 
it's without a doubt that it seems that neither uh, the powers that be in law nor in accounting actually teach you how to be a lawyer or an accountant. You have to figure <laughs> that out on your own. Okay. Now, the accounting profession does it a little better. At least I'm more familiar with the American model where sure. you are getting your, getting your hours and your, uh, getting your work experience while also preparing to pass the CPA exam. And so that's a, that's a better system. However, if you then plan to do something like I did, which was start your own practice, you have absolutely zero to build on unless you have also studied something along those lines at university, yeah. which I had not. So the, the shock of going from, okay, this is an academic exercise to now I need to actually apply not only it, but I need to apply psychology in speaking with my clients and with speaking with, with opposing, uh, the opposing side in my case, but the client really being the main thing, applying that, applying a marketing uh, ideas that you won't have learned about, applying, even though in the case of accounting, you've learned accounting, you still, there's a difference when it's keeping your own books and projecting and everything else. And so really, yeah, the shock is, is one that really can't be overstated. There's an expectation too in professional life that you do put in the hours. It is a slog. Yes. You do serve your time. You do churn out your, your billable rates. And you can't show any sign of weakness there because if you admit that you can't cope or show any signs of struggle, that's your career kiboshed, as we say. People put the brakes on you. People judge you. And it's not okay to be not okay, is it? Right. And, and that's something that obviously, especially if we go back to your theme earlier, Rob, of the uh, accounting profession's image mm. that really needs to change because, and, and we're seeing really across every uh, working level that that is starting to take hold, that it's starting to become all right to struggle and that the long time standing way of doing it, which was you just have to soldier on and you have to be tough and exude confidence, even in the face of, you know, the worst mental health of your life, that's falling away. I would really like to see it accelerate though. And I feel it's morally imperative on, especially those who are at the top running firms, running practices to make that a priority, to make sure that their people are okay. Mm -hmm. And as I understand mental health, I, I can't profess to having any mental health experience, but I am on medication for epilepsy. I had a stroke. I'm on the record with that. Right. And one of the side effects of my epilepsy medication is suicidal thoughts and mm. self-harming. So I'm, whilst I've not got those quite yet, I am very mindful of my emotional state and sure. my mental state of mind. And a few years ago, we weren't allowed to talk about mental well-being and mental health. We right. maybe touched on work-life balance. Maybe. <laughs> but these days, it's a lot more acceptable. So we'll come on to why it's more acceptable. To, but it starts with stress, doesn't it? So take us back to your position where you started to feel overloaded. You weren't sleeping right. You were, you were more stressed. You were put under pressure. Perhaps you didn't feel like you had the resources, the capabilities, the skills to deal with it. So the cracks started to appear. Is that right? That's that's pretty close, although there was a particular event in my life that kind of okay. precipitated the crisis, too. Can Certainly, you talk us through that? It, well, yeah. So it was right at the beginning of my law school journey. And so I had everything you just said, because everyone does when they're yeah. starting that. Uh, and then on top of that, I had had that kind of issue. So uh, it it really was just the worst kind of combination of things. And so the only way that I was able to get through that was by seeking support. And right. so with that as the model, um, because there were days, there, well, weeks, I should say, where every single day of the week, not only was I attending class and doing my readings and, and maybe writing and everything else, I was also attending some form of therapy all five days of the week wow. uh, and, and psychiatric treatment. And so now 
I look at that, and, and if we go by the kind of the old paradigm we were just discussing, that you've got to always remain tough and you know, you can't let it get to you and you can't crack. None of this, I would like to think, was any kind of, of sign that I'm not capable of doing good work or that I don't have some kind of talent or something to offer. But if we went by that old paradigm, the conclusion would be that, in fact, that was the case and that, you know, I just wasn't good enough and I couldn't hack it. But here I am now you know, advocating that, no, your people, you're going to get more out of them than you ever hoped if you will actually support them in their time of greatest need. Mm. I'm not to undermine any of the careers, but you could certainly have chosen a less stressful career than law. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or perhaps accounting. We know the high standards expected there, and I'm not saying to be a bricklayer or working McDonald's and anything else to denigrate that, but there no. are nine to five clock in, clock out, and the yeah. rest of the day is your own. But you chose a very rigorous academic career, which clearly put you under a huge amount of pressure. Talk to us about that point where you realized that you needed some external help, Justin. Well, uh, I had been only sleeping on the order of an hour or so a night. Wow. And the really, it was just an intrusive thoughts thing uh, where I almost felt as if I, I were not in control of my own mind and couldn't get those things out of my head and couldn't stop my mind wandering. Really, one of the few things that did help me in that respect was having all the material to focus on, oddly enough, right. in, in learning the law, sitting and reading for three hours, I could at least look at something and and get my attention onto it but the, the moment i stopped that uh would would come back so i just ultimately said okay clearly this isn't sustainable uh, i need to go looking and to the credit of my my university which is arizona state university their student health mental health program is absolutely incredible and uh i can contrast that directly to other universities I've seen where they're deeply lacking in student mental health. So I'm glad that I was there at the time because I received a number of services from them that really, really helped. Well, you, you get to that point as I've spoken to people. One of our guests on this show has been a guy called Andy Zolkeld, who was a big four uh, associate, went mm -hmm. through that life and, and, tried to take his own life. He got to that point where it was wow. all too much for him and he couldn't tell anyone. He right. certainly couldn't admit that he was not coping. Right. But if you're in an environment which will support you in that and allow you to acknowledge those triggers and make it okay to seek outside help, I'm just thinking people get to a point where they, they need to act out. So they medicate, they drink, they take yes. drugs, they do some kind of displacement activity to forget about the stuff that they're supposed to be doing because there's less pain in that. You've seen that, I'm sure. I have. And especially in the professions, um, since yes. we're kind of on that topic, mm. you see such a higher incidence of, of drug use, of alcohol use, of all sorts of things uh, to, to excessive levels in the professions. And so while, again, it ties back to the old way of doing things. Those were the ways that people found to cope and that they could either do in a socially acceptable way, because often much of that, especially drinking culture, was so rampant in the professions because everybody needed it really yeah. just to get through. And so it, that's why it's great that obviously the physical effects on people of that were going to be huge. And so at the same time that talking about your mental health is becoming more acceptable, that's also what that's going to mean is there's going to be less of that, which means just healthier people overall from a physical standpoint as well. Mm. Let's talk about the man problem. I've done a series of panels on this show with influential high-level female leaders in accounting to talk about some mm -hmm. of the challenges they face in, for instance, more than half of accountants are women, but around 9% of them only are in leadership roles and, and right. what's happening there and diversity and inclusion, equity, all of that. But certainly with men, they have their own challenges. For instance, uh, there's a certain bravado in men and, and man up and 
don't show that weakness or you'll get bullied. Even when you're on the playground, we learn that, don't we? That's right. And men have got to toughen up and grow a pair. We hear all of that, the testosterone stuff, the slaps on the back, the, that gung-ho mentality. Uh, but men are still prevalent as rulers and leaders in accounting professions, and uh, they have their own struggles, don't they? Certainly. I, there's no doubt that just due to whatever you want to call it, but it's clearly a dominant, generally Western idea of culture, what society, being a man. stereotypes, yeah. Right. And, and so as a result, that certainly has carried over. Uh, and, and I think, quite frankly, it's one of the biggest reasons it's taken so long for the profession to adapt and become more accepting of these things. It's only as it's been more acceptable on a society-wide level to allow men to express and even have emotions mm -hmm. and express them that uh, we're seeing that shift now. I do wonder, it, you bring up an interesting point that how much of that is going to be related to this disparity in the number of accountants that are women versus the number of accountants in leadership roles or, or high level that are women. And, and probably there is some inherent bias there uh, because for the longest time, it would have been, you know, the good old boys network, if you like. And uh, they'll have seen just the natural differences that are, that are kind of foisted upon us uh, in the genders and, and taken that and said, well, clearly that person, that woman is not suited for this high level role because she doesn't have as much control. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, it's something that I hope will also as a knock on effect to all of this start to even out. Well, there's certainly kudos in leadership, but huge responsibility and there's a cost. Yes. And we may be seeing some men paying the cost of the isolation Sure. of leadership, the huge responsibility of leadership and all of the things that's at stake. So and the other thing with men that I've certainly found, we've had Dan Stanley on this show, author of Rethinking Masculinity, and he speaks a lot about these problems. Mm -hmm. And he said, men don't talk. Men don't talk. Women, they have a network. Socially, they will share things. Whereas mm -hmm. men, less than half of men now have a best friend. For many men, their friends, their close friends are the husbands and boyfriends of their wives and girlfriends, <laughs> partners, those kind of people. So where do men go to let off steam? Where do men go to confide and have these important conversations where they admit that they're struggling a little bit? There isn't a lot of places they can go. There are not. You're right. And we see certainly the culture in the UK has long been, you go to the pub to blow steam off yeah. like that. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that in isolation, but when it becomes the only source, the only place you can really go for that kind of release, it's certainly not sustainable or healthy. And well, the downside to that, just in just jumping in, sure. uh, pubs and bars have been closing at the rate of 50 a month since 2020 here in yeah. the UK. At least, so we've we've lost that outlet, if you like. But even at the pub, the talk is often quite superficial. It's yes, football. It There's is. a little bit of work. Yep. But we we don't get into deep philosophical topics, and we don't talk about emotions as a rule. So that's true. Is that going on? Yeah, yeah. It's it's very difficult to find that sort of thing. I mean, certainly there are. It, it is something that I would like to see uh, if if employers are really serious about looking after their people is providing those kinds of resources and information to them and not just providing it, but proactively saying, Hey, check this out. Um, it's you're right that it's almost the way things are structured. Men just don't have those sorts of things naturally available to them. And then they're also, conditioned to be reticent to even talk about those deeper mm -hmm. things in the first place. So it's a really, really vicious cycle between the two, not really having the resources. And then even if you did, if you were one of the lucky half of men that have a best friend, maybe you're not going to be likely to talk to him about that thing that's really bothering you. 
Well, as we draw the show to a close, let's see if we can offer some hope and solutions to our audience here. Uh, and I'll kick things off while you think of a couple of things that both leaders could do in firms and the individuals themselves. But certainly vulnerability from the top Yes. to model that it's okay to be not okay Absolutely. is a start, isn't it? It is a start. And so is not holding on to that old way. It's setting an example to the people who work for you, who are looking to you as a guide because they don't have any idea <laughs> when they're coming into this, what am I supposed to do? They're looking for cues. Yeah. So if you're going in early, staying late, working weekends, if you're not taking holidays, if you're available 24 seven on your phone, they're going to think if they wanna be successful, that's the sort of thing they need to do. Yeah. If they also see a person who never expresses doubt or uncertainty, or sadness, or disappointment in themselves rather than others, they're also going to think that's the kind of person I need to be in order to be successful. Yeah, that's a really good point. Setting boundaries as well. If they see the leaders leaving at five o'clock, yeah, and coming in a little bit later and taking care of the kids and, and taking time for personal stuff, that's modeling a well-balanced life. That's exactly it. And, and word gets around too. And so this becomes not just a moral issue, but an economic issue, because eventually it will be the firms, the companies that do this in a healthy way, especially with the internet and all the information available out there that are the ones that are the sought after ones, mm -hmm. because the ones that don't do it that way will just not be appealing to people who are looking for quality employment. Another tip is. The most commonly asked question of someone we know or don't know is, how are you doing? How are you? Nice to meet you. How are things? How's it going? And we tend to give a, certainly in the UK, we give a very trite answer. Not too Always. bad. Mustn't grumble. Super busy. Doing okay. Yep. It's just a formula. It's a formula. And, and it stems partly from the people that are asking. They don't really want a long answer. They don't That's really true. care. They don't want you to sit down with them and talk for half an hour about what's really happening in life. So one of the things we could do to be better citizens and better friends is to ask people, how's it going? And really mean it and mm -hmm. hold people accountable for a more considered answer. I like that. And I agree. It's something that as a leader, you can do by simply calling people into your office and having them sit down and have a chat with you and just really dig. Um, obviously not to, not to the point that they're uncomfortable, but say, hey, you know, I'm interested to know how things are really going. Why don't you tell me about what's going on in your life? And that means a lot to people who are starting out and they're trying to find their way, especially if, as it turns out, there's something, you know, big going on in their lives. The other thing accountants have learned to do, and, and perhaps lawyers too, is to ask more questions. So they used to work with their clients because the accountants are the right. trusted advisors. They're the ones with all the answers, but they've got to do a lot of fact finding and digging. And they used to asking clients about not just business and commercial stuff, but personal stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And accountants have even stepped up into that role, particularly throughout the pandemic of being coaches, therapists, counselors, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, a shoulder to cry on a friend in times of trouble as they've, helped business owners navigate the complexities of a pandemic. So they do have a skill set which works on others, but getting that to work on themselves or doing that for their peers, that's that's a step up. Apparently it is, but it's interesting <laughs> how, how easily, when you put it that way, that you could just apply those skills. And of course, they're learned throughout the decades. I don't think everyone just walks into accounting know how to, knowing how to talk to clients all that yeah. well, but... But certainly it's not something that's entirely foreign. And there does seem to be a kind of artificial wall there, doesn't there? What we're seeing too, Justin, tell me if you've spotted this too, is that this more formal structured processes and roles in place. Have you heard of mental health first aiders? Uh, yes, yeah. So as I understand it, and you please add to this, these are people that are qualified in your office right. working environment, not just to handle it if you break your arm or scold yourself on the coffee machine. But if you have a breakdown or a mental block or something like that, an episode at work, 
they know how to take you through that. Right. Yeah, it's it's a program and an idea that has been sorely lacking. If we really believe that mental health is on the same par as physical health, then naturally mental health first aid is going to be a really necessary component of looking after that. And just like with first aid, that that sort of certification is available to people at varying levels to just be willing to contribute in that way, to be available and to be alert to help. I think it's a great initiative. Well, just and this has been a wonderful conversation. We'll put your contact details on the show notes in case people want to reach out to you. But just in closing, could you share with us one or two lessons that you've learned from your own journey that the professionals listening could perhaps consider, take to heart, maybe even apply to their own lives to help them deal more with the complexities and uncertainties of, of a very rigorous, professional, busy life? What would you say to them in closing? Well, I would say, I would hope that this trend toward flexible and remote work continues. Uh, and even in those cases though, where it does not, each of us can still look for times throughout our work day to help ourselves feel our best and some star things you can do to lower your anxiety and, and promote your mood as you can just take, when you have your break, just go out and walk and get outside. Obviously not always possible uh, on this island, but <laughs> uh, when it is possible and it's nice out especially. And you can even, depending on the facilities at the office, if you work there, or obviously if you are hybrid or home-based completely, uh -huh. is take a quick power nap. And a five to 15 minute power nap can absolutely refresh you, especially if you're having one of those days that you wish you hadn't gotten out of bed in the first place. It can, it can really flip a switch sometimes. And, and just exercise in general when you're not working as well is, I don't, don't think based on the research, there's anything that, can, that we have in our direct control that we can do that helps more than being physically active. Yeah. I'd add to that list too, Justin, breathing exercises just mm. simple deep breaths we use about a third of our lungs with every breath throughout mm. the day and and our lungs get smaller and smaller so a good sign of longevity and and mental health is having a good lung capacity so just taking some deep breaths is yeah. a good one and, and finally we hear a lot about sustainability uh keeping things going keeping a, a good culture of mental well-being so what closing advice would you give to the leaders the bosses the firm owners to set that culture of good mental health and an open dialogue where people can admit what's really going on. Yeah. And without minimizing other problems in the profession, I would just say that em employers, they need to realize that the data is out there and it's clear that it's in their economic best interest to make support directly available to people. And, and so this idea of sticking to the old ways because they're the ways that have always worked, not being willing to, willing to entertain those changes. It's actually truly rational in every sense to be both proactive and reactive in supporting your employees yeah. uh, and their mental health. Well, Justin Grant, that's been wonderful, meaningful, and very thought provoking. Thank you so much for your time and your insights today. We've really enjoyed that. It's been a pleasure, Rob. Thank you very much for having me. 